Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So uh, that's a new bumper video, which means that we're doing a new thing. Um, and I want to tell you how we got to the thing that we're going to be doing. Because I had talked to a few of you about we're going to be doing, actually I may have even mentioned it in church last week. I do this every time. Last week, Grant texted me after I got up here and started talking, and he texted me, hi, my name is Dave, because I always forget to do that. So let's stop everything and do that right now. Hi, my name is Dave. I'm the lead pastor here at Aviator Church. If you're new here, uh, I'm really grateful that you are here. I'd love to get a chance to talk to you out in the lobby after church. Uh, if you're old here, whatever. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Um, just kidding. Thank you guys so much for being here. But uh, so anyways, I, anytime that we finish a series, I have to kind of decide, like, what are we going to do next? And a lot of times, if you've been here for a while, uh, you know that I like to take those weeks in between series, and I uh, do a series that I call Ruining Your Favorite Bible Verses, right? Uh, where I'll take verses that oftentimes get taken and used out of context, and I slam them kicking and screaming back into context so that you don't get a tattoo of a Bible verse on you without understanding what it means, right? Um, and so that's kind of my approach uh, to understanding understanding scriptures. I want to make sure that we understand it within context. And so I was going to start Galatians, but uh, I'm just going to tell you now up front, uh, over the next three weeks, you guys ready for a tease? Here you go. Each of the next three weeks, including today, we're going to be making big announcements about the future of our church. Ooh. So stay tuned. Don't fall asleep during the message or you'll miss the big announcement. Um, but anyways, we're going to be making big announcements, and I knew that was coming, and so I didn't want to start Galatians because I know that on the third of those weeks, I'm probably going to take a break from Galatians to address one of the announcements. And so anyways, like, I was like, what can I do? And I was like, I'm going to ruin a Bible verse, right? That's what I'm going to do. And so I started looking, and I found one. Found one. It was Habakkuk 1.5 is the Bible verse that, that I uh, decided that I'm going uh, to ruin for you. And I'll just go ahead and read it to you off of my screen here. Listen to this and just hear how majestic it sounds. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. God says, watch and look, I'm going to do something so astounding and so wonderful that you wouldn't even believe it if I told it to you, right? And that sounds awesome. So I need to ruin that for you, right? need to ruin that verse for you. And so what we're going to do is I, I actually decided I'm going to teach on Habakkuk 1.5 this week. But then, you know how this goes. I was going to teach you on Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And then we spent nine weeks in Obadiah. You remember that, right? So anyways, I started looking at it. I was like, I don't know how to do this without teaching the entirety of the book of Habakkuk, right? And so here's what we're doing. Over the next two weeks, in order to explain the full context of what this verse, I'll read it to you again, listen. Look among the nations and see wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. We're going to take that verse and put it into the context of the entirety of the book of Habakkuk, and we're doing it in two weeks, an entire book, every single verse in two weeks. So, uh, and I see somebody shaking their head no already. It's like, oh, we're doing it. We're doing it. It's going to happen. And so in order to do that, I like to usually find spots where if I'm going to take a Bible verse and explain how it gets used out of context, I'll usually pull up a, a video, it could be of a sermon or of whatever, of that verse being used in the way in which I'm telling you that kind of it gets used to kind of highlight the, the misuse of it. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying this. I'm going to show you it's a, it's a clip from a church, and I believe the intent of this clip and of using this verse is absolutely good, okay? I don't think this is somebody trying to manipulate or use a verse out of context. I think that they were doing a, a video uh, to explain some ministries that they were going to be doing within their church, um, and they just, this one sounded good, right? And I don't think that they went much beyond that. I don't think that there's anything wrong with what they're doing or the, the mission that they're putting in, but I will show you how easy it is to take a verse that means one thing and try to slam it into a context that means a very different thing. So uh, with that in mind, I want you to take a look at this video here. This is the uh, Habakkuk 1.5. Look at the nations. Look at the nations. Look at the nations and watch. And be utterly amazed. Utterly amazed. Utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days. Something in your days. Something in your days. That you would not believe. That you would not believe, even if you were told. Even if you were told. Even if you were told. Now 
Our God is an unexpected God. He works through unexpected people. He calls us to unexpected places. He leads us into unexpected circumstances. So that the lost, the weary, the burdened, and the broken may encounter him. So look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed at the glory of our unexpected God. Now, again, just to be clear, I'm not saying, so once upon a time I preached here and there's a verse in the Bible that says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. And that usually gets used by pastors um, when they have low attendance on a Sunday, right? And they'll say, hey, it's okay that we're missing people. Wherever two or three are gathered, there I'll be in the midst of them. And then I preached on that passage, and I explained that that passage is actually talking about church discipline. Well, I had uh, some members whom I love very much who came and said, so are you saying that that's not the case, that he's not with us? Like, no, 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 he's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time, right? He's definitely with us if two or three are gathered. The principle is not wrong, but it doesn't fit. The, the, the verse itself is not saying that. Does that make sense? And so again, I want to say this. I don't think that like, the intent or the principle is wrong there. I think God does incredible things, mighty things that are good. And they're, they're talking about doing missions. I, I looked up their church website. Like they focus on uh, overseas missions. That's a great thing. And I think God does things that, that are beyond our ability to understand. But what I need you to know is that Habakkuk 1.5 5 is not talking about that. Okay? And so today we're going to do the entire first chapter and the first verse of chapter 2 of Habakkuk to start to put into context exactly what this is. And just like with all of the times that we do one of these sermons or these little mini-series, I will tell you this, the real significance of what's going on in the book is substantially more profound than limiting it to saying, oh, God's going to do neat, good stuff right? It's so much better. And so my prayer today, as it always is, is that as I am bringing the word of God to you today, uh, that God would use me, a very broken preacher, in order to convey a very perfect message. Uh, and so before we dive into the scripture, I'd like to pray to that effect. Father God, that we come to you today, and God, we are hungry to know you. God, we want to experience you in a new way. God, as we uh, continue the ministry of the church after the celebration that is Easter Sunday, God, I pray that uh, God, our desire for you would not be limited to Easter Sunday or to uh, the resurrection story that, God, we're not looking to get out of you just what's good for us, but we want all of you, even the parts that are difficult to understand, even the parts that we struggle through. So, God, as we open up this Old Testament book, God, I pray that you would give us uh, ears to hear and hearts to be attentive to your word, God, that we might understand what you're calling us to hear, uh, and it might take us to a deeper level in understanding of who you are. God, we love you and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So it's called, Nevertheless, the Story of Habakkuk. Now, uh, we're going to jump in. I think we should be on my screen now. We are. Uh, we're going to start, like I said, just going straight through today. What's good about this, sometimes when you read, uh, this is a, a book of prophecy, right? It's a prophet in the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes when you read books of prophecy, it is very confusing, right? Sometimes you're trying to make sense of what does this mean if you don't understand the culture and all this stuff. What I love about this, honestly, uh, I've read through the book probably six or eight times just yesterday. Um, reading through this. It's a short book, and it's clear, and it's easy to understand. And what I really love about this is you get to see a dialogue, a conversation between Habakkuk and God. Uh, oh, by the way, actually, I, asked, I was asked this before we got here, too. Somebody said, how do you say the name? I say Habakkuk because that's the first way that I learned it. Some people call him Habakkuk, right? Uh, or if you want to get super Hebrew and impress your friends, it's Habakkuk. That's how you say it, okay? So, uh, you know, Every house, uh, somebody takes care of the kitchen. Every house, have a cook, right? So anyways, <laughs> that one's for free. You can just take that with you as you go. So anyways, we're going to start with the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. And this is, so starting here in verse 2. Oh, that's the wrong one. I want, wait a second, stand by. I want this one. Yeah, that's better. Starting here in verse 2, this is Habakkuk. In my Bible, it says this is Habakkuk's first complaint, right? Uh, so I'm telling you, parents, as you hear this conversation between uh, Habakkuk and God, uh, you're going to hear a series of complaints, um, and it will make you feel uh, very parental as you listen to God's responses. Habakkuk says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, 
and you will not hear, or cry to you, violence, and you will not save. That's, that's a lot right off the top. Oh, Lord, there's two questions. How long shall I cry for help, right? Uh, and how long shall I cry to you violence, that things are violent and bad? And then there's two things that God is being accused of not doing. How long will I do this where you will not hear and you will not save, right? Now, this is a book for anybody who has ever been praying and felt as if I keep praying to God and God is not hearing me. And the, the reason we say God's not hearing me because I think fundamentally we all know that God hears everything, right? So it's not that he doesn't actually hear you, but how do we internalize not being heard? It's because he's not doing anything about what I asked him to do something about. And so how long do I have to cry to you for help? How long do I have to cry and plead out violence before you're going to get up and do something about it? Now, we're going to go ahead and ruin the first point. It's okay to go to God like that. If you're hurting, if you're upset, if you're confused, read the Psalms, man. If you want to see somebody who's angry and talking to God and working through it, now it's not okay to go in disrespect, but it is okay to say, like, what are, what's going on? What are you doing? I need clarity on this thing. And sometimes you'll even get it, right? How long should I have to do this? Now, just so you understand, the cry that he's saying is that he is calling out against his own people right now. God, I look around. And, and, and so there was a king named Josiah, and Josiah brought in a bunch of religious reform. He took the kingdom over, I think when he was eight. Um, he was a small child. But anyways, he found some of the religious writings, and he led the nation through a religious revival where they turned back to God. Well, after him was a series of kings who were uh, different levels of bad and unworthy and unjust. Uh, and so what he is now crying out is he's saying, like, the, the oh boy, you ready for this one? God, I look around, and this government has turned its back on its people. The evil are running the show. And, like, how long are we going to have to cry out and say that, like, the, the bad people are winning before you're going to do something about it? It is a blessing from God that we don't deal with stuff like that anymore. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, uh, I should have put that in my notes. I missed an opportunity. I, I feel like this is probably a good opportunity to explain to you that we do have a class coming up that you should know about on biblical citizenship. Did you know that? Uh, on Tuesday night, starting on April 16th at 6.30, um, what is the role of us uh, as Christians, uh, what is our role as citizens in our government, in our uh, 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 call to be a part actively in our own governing and in our own leadership? What are our responsibilities? What are not our responsibilities biblically. Uh, Larry Craig is teaching a class that starts on Tuesdays at 6.30, April 16th. I haven't talked to my wife about this. I'm planning on taking tithes for that, by the way, just to put that on the calendar. Anyways, that's a thing to be aware of, right? But, but essentially, Habakkuk is in a very similar spot to where many of us in America are today. We're crying out and saying, like, things are broken and crooked and corrupt. And this is, if you're like, oh, so you're saying that about the people in charge now? Nope. They're all corrupt. You ready for that? I don't care which side of the aisle you're on. It's the wrong side if it's not God's side. So, so to that end, Habakkuk is crying out and saying, I, how long are you going to let wicked people do terrible things without punishing them? Right? Now, I think every single person in the room, if you're being honest, has had this prayer at some point in your life. So-and-so did something to me. God, get them. Right? Like, go. Like, you're like, he's, he's, he's your, your attack dog on a leash. It's like, now, smite, smite. I'm going to tell you it's okay to go to God with questions like this. I'm also going to tell you you may not always get the answer you want. Verse 3. Why do you make me see iniquity? Iniquity, sin, wrongdoing. Why do you make me see it? And why do you idly look at wrong? Why are you sitting up there doing nothing about it? Why do I have, if I see it, surely you can see it. He uses four words here that are all synonyms for injustice, destruction, and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. These are uh, some of the same words used in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, 
uh, starting at one of the verses that I love in Genesis 6, and I've talked about this one before, uh, Genesis 6, 5, uh, is that uh, God looked down at the people and he saw that every inclination of their heart was only evil all the time, right? Women, have you ever thought that about your husband, right? Every single thing you do is only dumb 100% of the time, right? It's three absolutes. There is no question, right, that the, the, the behavior and the, the uh, heart of the people before God at that point was full of destruction, check, violence, check, strife, check, contention. And so these people have now risen to positions of authority. They are leading the, the, the house of Judah down this path that is terrible. And, and Habakkuk is looking at it and his his sense of justice, or really, I guess, a sense of injustice, has stirred about within him. And he's saying, these people are doing this, and they're acting like this, and God, you're doing nothing about it. There are innocent people who are suffering here. What are you doing? Do you know there was a Pew poll a while back uh, that said, if, if, or assuming that God is real, and you could sit down and ask him one question, what would that one question be? And the overwhelming, most popular answer was some version of this question. Why are you letting bad things happen? Why are you letting evil people win? Why are you letting good people suffer? Which that in and of itself is a loaded question. Here's a biblical hint for you. There are no good people. But that was, that was just a sideburn. I'm just making everything terrible today. Right? But this is the question Habakkuk is asking. Why do I see it? But seemingly you don't. Verse 4. So, what's the result of this? The law is paralyzed. The law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. What's the result of all this, God, of you not stepping in and smiting those who need to be smited? Is that now they are running the show, they surround the righteous, and justice is no longer going out. Justice is completely perverted. Your law is paralyzed. Now, if you've been here long enough, we've talked about the law because we went through the book of Deuteronomy. The law was given to create an order for the nation of Israel in their relationship with God. And what Habakkuk is saying, what you designed to give us order and structure has been turned and now is used for chaos and destruction everywhere we go. Your law is perverted. Your law is paralyzed. I have told you this story before, but I feel like it fits really well here and it's been long enough that I think I'm past the point of being able to use it again. When I was a youth pastor and knew nothing about anything, okay? But when I was a youth pastor, I had a mom in my youth group who had a kid who was uh, particularly uh, difficult we'll call it, right? Uh, acted out a lot, was stealing from his sisters at home, and was uh, just a real handful at the house. And one day, uh, his mom, so this is back when the PlayStation 2 was like the gaming uh, platform. And so this kid, Cody, had a PlayStation 2. Uh, and one day, his mom got so fed up with him doing stuff, and he kept stealing from his sister, going into his sister's room and stealing money so he could go buy stuff at the gas station or whatever, right? He gets so mad that she says to her son, she says, if you take money from your sister one more time, I'm going to destroy your PlayStation 2. I'm going to break it into a million pieces. You'll never guess what happened. About a week later, kid steals from his sister again. Mom comes into my office. Now, mind you, at this point, I'm 24 years old. I don't have children. I don't have all of the answers like I do now, right? <laughs> And so the mom comes in and she says to me, I am at my wit's end with this child. I told him that if he stole from his sister again, I'm going to destroy his, or his, his PlayStation. And then he went and stole from his sister again. I do not know what to do. That you don't? Because I do. You go home and you take out the heaviest hammer that you have and you go out into the driveway and you put that PlayStation right in the middle of the driveway and you bash that thing until there's so many pieces and then you make him clean up the mess. That's what you do, right? And she said, she's like, well, I'm not really going to do that. And I said, then you never should have said it. 
right? If you're not going to do anything about it, then the law doesn't matter. Because he knows he can get away with doing whatever he wants to. And that, in a nutshell, is what Habakkuk is saying to God. You gave us the law. You told us to act a certain way and to do certain things. And those who subvert your law have risen to power. You're not doing anything about it. You said there was going to be consequence. Where's the consequence? It's a fair question. And I think it's a fair question for us today in our country. Verse 5, or excuse me, point (laughs) 1. From our lessons in Habakkuk, it's perfectly acceptable to go to God with tough questions. At no point in God's response, you'll see this, at no point does he say, how dare you? How dare you question me? He doesn't say that. There's going to be a dialogue between God and Habakkuk here where God's going to explain himself to Habakkuk where he's going to explain what the result of the sin is going to be. And yet at no point does God ever lash out. As a father, I hope my children feel comfortable coming to me with difficult questions. Even if it's about the way that I parent. Even if it's about things where I have made mistakes. I've gotten to a point where I have children who are old enough now where they have called me out for my own bad behavior at times. And I don't prefer it, but I do appreciate it. You understand? Like, there's been times where, believe it or not, I've not been the perfect parent. I know. I know. And yet, in those moments, I'm happy to have those conversations with my kids. I, when they're asking questions about life that are difficult and ugly and harsh, I want to be able to be the one to give those answers to my children, right? God does not discourage the tough questions. And as a matter of fact, for what it's worth, it's a little bit prideful of us to think that my question is going to be so hard and complex for the God of the universe that he's not going to be able to handle, right? So anyways, point number one, it is perfectly acceptable to go to God with tough questions. Now, that is the the verses leading up to the verse that I'm going to ruin through the next two weeks, okay? So remember, the verses before it is, God, what are you doing? Why aren't you, why aren't you, crushing people where they stand, right? The ones who are, who are unholy and unrighteous, who are perverting justice. Why aren't you getting them? And here we have our verse, verse 5. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Now see, this, this is the God that we like. This is the God when we go to him with our frustration. He says, oh, I'm going to do something amazing. Just sit back and enjoy the show. It's going to be spectacular. And in this moment, I have to believe that Habakkuk is like, here we go. Let's go. Woo! Right? This is going to be good stuff. I'm really excited. There's no way that what comes after that verse could possibly be bad. No possible way at all that what comes after that ver- it's look and be astounded i'm doing a mighty work before you that can only be good if you feel like i'm putting it on thick it's because i am verse six for behold i am raising up the chaldeans now let's do a little bible history uh, the chaldeans is another word for a group of people known as the babylonians and they are bad. That's my uh, Bible teaching for the day. I'm raising up the, <laughs> the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and how, this is uh, Johnny Carson, you know those uh, Babylonians are pretty bad. Can I just say, I love that we have got a new generation of people in this church. I did that one time here before, and I was like, you know, it's so hot, and everyone's like crickets. You guys who know things, I love you so much. Anyways, how bad are they? I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings that are not their own. Hey, I got news for you. You are so mad about all of the corruption that you want me to do something about it. I've already been laying the groundwork as the answer to your prayer. Babylon. And at this point, Habakkuk said, Oh, no. 
Verse 7, what about the Babylonians? They are dreaded and they are fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. This is actually kind of a funny statement because uh, they're not exactly known for justice or dignity, right? And yet, what they are good about is uh, reading their own press clippings, right? And so they go and they take over people and they believe themselves to be justified in every evil and terrible thing that they do. And so, like literally, as before they get there, like the, literally the the aura of who the Babylonians see themselves to be will arrive upon you before you ever actually see them because they're so just and so dignified. They're dreaded, they're fearsome, they're awful. What about their horses? Dave, does it say anything about their horses? Well, it does. Their horses are swifter than leopards. You ever seen a leopard run down its prey on one of those animal channels? Well, that's high praise for a horse, right? They're swifter than leopards. Leopards are, turns out, pretty swift. They're more fierce than the evening wolves. They have battle horses who are trained, and when, they come, when the cavalry comes, you, you Israel, you Judah, will stand no chance. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. Swift to devour is a great phrase, right? I would like that to be the title of my biography one day, right? Swift to devour, the Dave Atherton. So that just sounds like mean, right? That's cool. Swift to devour. They're not coming with diplomacy in mind. Teddy Roosevelt used to have a thing that he would say uh, uh, as far as his approach to diplomacy. You remember it? Speak softly, and carry a big stick, right? So the Babylonians had one too. And it was, speak loudly and use that big stick to kill everybody you can reach, right? They're not coming to have conversation. They're not coming to convince you that maybe you should join into their empire or to their kingdom. They are coming to kill you and take off the women. And they're coming to just absolutely ransack your villages and, and consume and devour everything that stands in their way. Hey, Habakkuk, how is it feeling now getting a response from God? Verse 9, they, in case you're not clear on exactly who the Babylonians are, they all come for violence, their faces forward. This is kind of a cool one, too. They don't turn to the right or the left. When they are on mission to take you out, there is no distracting them. You're not going to outflank them. You're not going to outstrategy them. They are coming, and they will not stop until they prevail. They gather captives like the sand. You ever been to the beach? You know what there's a lot of at the beach? sand, right? You want to know how many captives they gather? Like the sand. Ooh, what, wasn't that the, like, sand through the hourglass? So are the captives of the Babylonians. I think that was from a show that nobody should have watched. If you're laughing, it's because you're a sinner. Verse 10. <laughs> that one wasn't in my notes either. At kings, they scoff. They look at rulers and they laugh. They laugh at every fortress for they pile up earth and take it. Verse 11, then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose might is their own God. I, I feel like I'm getting a pretty glim picture of what it's going to be like when the Babylonians show up. Now, let's go back to our points. Point number one, it is perfectly acceptable to go with God, to go to, excuse me, to, go to God with tough questions. And number two, you may not appreciate the answer that you're going to get. You may not. You may say, but justice would indicate that you wipe out the evil, you know, people who are in the government and then put good people in charge. That's what I think your justice should be. You know what you don't get to do? You don't get to tell God what justice is. That's a thing that you don't get to do. You can be upset about it, or you can be sad about it, or you can cry about it, or you can do all kinds of things about it, but you don't get to dictate to God what his justice should look like. You may not appreciate the answer you get. Last night, we had dinner. We do that frequently at our house. All right? You know why? I have a cook. Anyways. <laughs> we had dinner. My wife made spaghetti, and... Uh, we, we put spaghetti out um, for the children to eat. Spaghetti is a staple in our house. We eat it often, and our kids like it. 
and we get to the dinner table, and all of a sudden, Augustine today decides that spaghetti is the worst thing that he's ever seen in his entire life. And he starts pouting at the dinner table, and he has this real, it's adorable and frustrating all at the same time. This face that he makes when he's upset is like, <sniffs> and so he's like, I don't want spaghetti. And then he starts saying this, I'm not hungry. Right? I heard him say, I'm not hungry a thousand times. Like, baby, you need to eat. I don't, I'm not hungry. Right? Well, this week on Thursday was uh, one of our other boys' birthdays. And for his birthday, uh, we had uh, a carrot cake that was made for his birthday. He decided he wanted carrot cake of all things. Whatever. I will say this. As carrots go, it was the tastiest carrot I've ever had. But it's not... <laughs> not the kind of cake I would have picked myself, but whatever. It was a good cake. She's a, it was a, a girl from our homeschool group last year made it. Anyways, so we get a carrot cake, and, and the boys had, they, they, nobody wanted carrot cake at first, and then they all tried it. It was like, carrot cake's amazing. You know why? Turns out it's cake, right? And so anyways, uh, after my kids all had their spaghetti, uh, my wife bust out the carrot cake, and all of a sudden, Augustine, who was not hungry, you might recall, three minutes ago, well, miracle of all miracles, all of a sudden the boy's like, oh, I want carrot cake, right? Right? He cried out to his father, father, I want carrot cake. Let me have the carrot cake. And you know what answer I gave him? You can absolutely have carrot cake. All of the carrot cake that you want. Carrot cake as far as the eye can see after you eat your spaghetti. He did not, he, see, he called for action. His father responded. He did not appreciate the answer that he got. He did eat his spaghetti, though, right? Because he finally figured out that that's better, I guess. Dad's way is better because at the end of it, I get carrot cake. That, that's got to preach somehow with the story of Habakkuk. Moving on. So this is God's response from Habakkuk. And here, I love this part. Here we go. He says, this is Habakkuk's response now to God. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. See, Augustine, after I told him, yeah, you can have uh, the uh, spaghetti after you eat your cake. You know what he looked at me? And this was, if he could have worded it this way, oh, da, 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 da. Let's not be so hasty, right? Let's not, let's not jump to wild ideas about how to do things. Let's have a conversation, you and I. You recall how Habakkuk started this book, right? Where are you? I've been crying. How long do I have to cry out to you, God, before you'll do something? Before you stop sitting idly? I can see the injustice. Can you not see the injustice? Right? And so God says, you're right. I'm going to do a mighty and wonderful thing. Well, not wonderful. Mighty and astounding thing. Right? I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans, and they're going to come and <laughs> take you out. And Habakkuk's like, eh, hold on a second. Let's talk about our options, right? Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? I do think it's cool, too. Are you not from everlasting, right? Uh, highlighting the, the, uh, the omnipotence, the omniscience, the omnipresence of who God is, the bigness of God, but then bringing it into, O Lord, who? My God, the personal nature that I have with this biggest possible powerful being that can be. Surely we won't die. O oh Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O oh rock, have established them for reproof. You, who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? He's confused. Can I tell you a, a deep, dark truth? You ready for this? There are times where I've been confused by God. Right? Not that he's a God of confusion. That's not to say that he is being confusing. It's to say that I cannot comprehend. Saying you're the one who's pure and righteous and holy, and, and yet here you're going to have the wicked swallow up the man more righteous than he. No matter how bad we are, God, they're worse. Here, put it in perspective for you. I actually heard this uh, as an illustration that I, I don't remember who it was. I was listening to a sermon this week. Uh, and so the equivalent of this would be for us to say, oh God, 
our leaders here in America are evil. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's just to be clear, I wasn't saying it. I'm just throwing it out for you. I'm not not saying it. Right? But, oh, Lord, our, lead, our leaders are evil, right? We, we cry out for, for serious consequence, for their injustice, for their, for, their, for their evil ways, their wickedness that goes up before you. We cry out for that. And God says, great. ISIS. How you feel about that? Does that feel like the course correction you were hoping for? No. Terrorism, sure. We'll deal with it. We read the Bible sometimes, and I think we try to remove the emotional component of the people who are having the encounters with God. I understand why Habakkuk's confused. I understand why he's frustrated. I understand why he's scared. It makes a fair amount of sense. So he's saying to God... I'm confused by this. One of the, the commentaries that I read, I, I put this in my notes, says the prophet's faith in a holy God is challenged by the reality of his choice of the Babylonians as an instrument of punishment. This causes Habakkuk to again plead the question, why? Right? I want you to fix it. I want you to make it right. But I don't want that. Right? Verse 14. You make mankind like the fish of the sea. Just to be clear, this mankind is a little bit confusing in the Hebrew. Um, he's actually talking about the house of Judah or these people, Israel, right? Um, you make us, man, men, like the fish of the sea. This is what we're going to be like. Crawling around things that have no ruler. You ever seen a bunch of flish? Flish? That's fish and flopping. When you combine those, you get flish. We've well, seen fish flopping around on the ground, right? can't do anything for themselves, completely like vulnerable and unprotected. We're going to be like a bunch of fish flopping around before the Babylonians. He, this is he being uh, Babylon. Babylon brings all of them up with a hook, continuing the fishing uh, 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 illustration. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them into his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. There are actual monuments today existing in Mesopotamia about the Babylonians. And one of the things that they would frequently do, so this is something you miss culturally if you don't understand. One of the things that the Babylonians, when they would go in and take over a people, whatever ones they didn't slaughter, if they were taking them into be slave labor or uh, sometimes, again, taking the women into, uh, you know, you know. Anyways, uh, when they would take the people away, one of the things that they would do is they would take long lines, like strings, right? Uh, and they would take hooks, like fishing hooks, and put them through the bottom lips of the people, and then they would, so that there's a long string connected to all of these people by the lip, and then make them walk back that way, all connected with hooks through their lips. Well, that's terrible. So this is not just a picture that he's painting. This is a thing that actually happened. He brings them out with a hook. Babylon brings them, and he drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. And then what does he do as he's watching these people dejected, family members killed, in all kinds of pain, with hooks through their lips, walking back to wherever they're being told to go? They, Babylon rejoices and is glad. The wickedness of Babylon. Therefore... He sacrifices to his net and he makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. He takes them and puts them into slavery. He kills them whenever he seems as beneficial. Babylon, again, God, I understand. I understand that I asked you for judgment on the leadership in my nation, but that didn't mean send a more evil, wicked nation to come take me out. Verse 17. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and keep mercilessly killing nations forever? So this is a question to God. God, are you really going to just let this keep happening? Verse 1 of chapter 2. I will take my stand at my watch post. I will station myself on the tower, and I will look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. kind of feels a little bit like already he's given up, right? But he throws out a second plea here. So uh, the book, if you read it, it the, the first pericope is, is Habakkuk's first complaint, and then the next section is God's response, and then this section is Habakkuk's second complaint. 
oh, hold on, God, that's not what I meant. Right? By the way, you do remember that Habakkuk 1.5 uh, is you. I just want to make sure that we're not losing the thread here. That it, that is used as a thing that says, behold, God is going to do an amazing thing. You see why I would say that verse needed to be ruined in that context? Because there's nothing amazing from Habakkuk's perspective about what is happening right here. He's saying, I've said what I have to say, now I'm going to sit. Now, keep in mind what brought this conversation on in the first place. Habakkuk got tired of sitting around and waiting for a response from God, right? And so what is he saying now? Okay, didn't appreciate the first response very much. I will sit for as long as it takes. I'm going to sit here and station myself. I'm going to look out and see what you're going to say to me. Let's look at our points again, shall we? Point number one, it is perfectly acceptable to go to God with tough questions. Point number two was, you may not appreciate the answer that you get. Point number three is, it is perfectly acceptable to go to God with the tough questions. He went with them, <laughs> he went with one tough question, got an answer, goes back with another tough question. Are you really going to send those unjust people to wipe, to wipe out our people who are less unjust? Less unjust? Whatever. Make it make sense in your head. Yeah. I think Habakkuk looks at it and says, is that really the answer? Is that really the answer? This is what we're doing, really? I got to tell you, the last uh, four years for our church have been kind of funny. I'll close on this. The last four years at our church um, has been a, ser a series of Dave and the exec team. Once the exec team got added in, the poor exec team. If you know an exec team member, give them a hug, okay? Because uh, they've had to put up with me for four years. And, and what it's been is this. I spend a lot of time praying, and I'm trying to figure out what can we do, and what can we do, and what can we do, and what can we do. And I'm looking for answers, and I'm trying to figure out an answer. And like every single time we got close to having an answer, the answer fell apart, and it didn't work. And it was so frustrating. And can I, can I be real honest with you here? There were absolutely times where my prayer sounded a wee bit like Habakkuk here. God! What are you doing? I'm trying really hard to do it the right way. I'm trying really hard to lead in the way that you've called me to lead. Where are you at? What are you doing? What are you bringing to the equation right now, God? Oh, the pride and arrogance of man. Right? God, what are you doing? Where is it at? You know how, uh, so you guys, you, I don't know if you remember this, we moved buildings recently. Remember that? Can I tell you the funniest thing about all of that process? On this one, I did nothing. I did nothing. This thing dropped out of the clear blue sky. Right, hey Dave, you want to have lunch? I want to talk to you, says a pastor that I've never met in my entire life. We sit down and we talk. He's like, I happen to hear you guys were looking at a thing. I think we might be closing our church down. Would you like to come look at it? Meanwhile, the exec team we talked about this a couple weeks ago is literally planning an intervention for me. Right? Like, Dave, we're not looking at any, just we're going to make it work, stop it, right? And so legitimately, God, in his time, drops the answer out. Now, it just so happened, I love this answer. This is a great answer. Habakkuk is now at the position where after this exchange, he has prayed, and now he has heard what the answer is going to be. He prayed again, asking, are you sure, Right? And what is his response at this point? I think Habakkuk is growing in his faith. Habakkuk sits down and says, I'm just going to wait. Whatever it is, whatever is your timing, I'm just going to wait. So we'll wrap by saying this. Hey, person who came to church today with unrest in your life, right, who is unsettled in whatever thing it may be, maybe it's your career, maybe it's your family, maybe it's your marriage, I don't know. Whoever came here with unrest today, who is carrying with them all of the weight and all of the burden, who you feel like you've been praying, and you're saying, God, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? And you feel like there is just no response. Again, you heard it from him. How long do I have to cry out before you're finally going to do something about it? And I know that we have enough people here that right now, statistically, somebody's in that place. Can I offer you a word of encouragement from the book of Habakkuk? Say your piece, and then be quiet. And sit back, and just wait. Now, Dave, 
that's not helpful to me in my current situation. I know that. I do. I feel that. But I'm telling you, trying to force things to happen is not going to be the way to make it work. Trying to bring about your understanding of righteousness or your understanding of justice or your understanding of judgment, it's not going to work. And so to say that God doesn't hear you, we know is untrue because God hears everything, right? To say that he's not operating on your timetable may also be true, but who cares about your timetable? How about that for a harsh truth today? God gives you what you need when you need it. And that's what you take away from this. Again, I look at Habakkuk 1.5 and I see people who take it and, and, and I'm, I gotta, I just wanna make sure that I'm clear on this. I'm not saying God doesn't do amazing things that you wouldn't believe. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm saying is that's not what this is. What this is is saying I have answers for your prayers and you're not always going to love them. But the question that you should be asking is not why is this happening to me, but what can I learn from not why is this happening to me, but how can this change me to be more like Christ in my life? Habakkuk, we're going to pick up again next week right here, because the the conversation, believe it or not, gets even better. And then chapter 3 is a prayer that Habakkuk prays, and we're going to close with that prayer next week. But I just want you to know, if you're here and you're carrying it, I hear you. Offer it to God in whatever words you need to offer it to God, and he's not afraid of your tough questions. And then you have to be do, willing to do the hard work of waiting for his response. Let's pray. Father God, God, today is a message that I don't necessarily love all the parts of. God, reading the story of Habakkuk is a humbling thing and a stressful thing and a trying thing. Because God, I understand the heart of Habakkuk. The heart that says, God, I want what I want, and I want it now. It's the same heart that exists in children when they don't want to eat one food, but will eat another. And so, God, I pray that you would help us as a church to be more mature than that. God, to go deeper than that. To look past the immediate feelings that we're feeling, and instead to put our trust in you even when we're walking through those emotions and those hurts. God, for the people who are hurting today, God, I pray that your response is clear. And I pray that your response is in your time. And I pray that, God, you would, you would give patience where patience is needed in order to wait for that right time. Having been through enough moments in my life, God, I can always look back and see where you've worked. God, I pray that, that you would make it clear that even when I can't see where you're working, that I can still trust you. God, I pray that prayer over everybody in this church who's joining us here today, who's going to listen online later. God, even though we don't know where you're going, we can still trust you to be good, even if the circumstances seem bad. We love you and we praise you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Okay, I told you at the beginning of the message today that we're going to have major announcements, major announcements for each of the next three weeks. Uh, I'm going to tell you, they're not like ascending in order. All three are awesome and big announcements. Um, But uh, today uh, was our first one. You ready for this? Um, So uh, you might recall a few months ago, um, we announced that we had a change in staffing happening, and uh, Caitlin stepped into our children's ministry and first off has done a dynamite job down there. Um, Has been, oh yeah, you can give her. She has been organizing and cleaning and recruiting and training and doing all of the things and has been doing just just a fantastic job and we're so grateful for our exec team met with Caitlin this week so we when we first put her in we uh, we, we put her in and it was uh, as an interim capacity and we just honestly we needed to get into the building and we needed to get here and get settled and whatever um, and then we figured we'd make a plan down the road um, after talking to her and I'll let her speak to this a little bit and talking with the exec team this week um, I'm excited that our first announcement is to say uh, that Caitlin will actually be staying on in a more permanent capacity here as the non-interim children's director, and we are very excited for that. So, Caitlin, come on up here. So, I think this should be on. So, what I've asked Caitlin to do here is just kind of talk a little bit about kind of what God's been doing in her own heart and life through the last two, two months that felt like 14 years. Um, 
Uh, and then she's also going to close out with the big three today. So, uh, but anyways, uh, as you guys are leaving today, we a lot of times with new members will bring people down, and it's a shake of hand. Uh, find Caitlin out in the lobby, and especially if you have kids. If you have kids, what you should do is just like just fall down on your knees in front of her and say thank you for taking them for an hour. Uh, man, my life is so much better when I can come to church and listen. But anyways, in all seriousness, like thank her for the work she's doing. Um, get to know her. If you're not volunteering in kids. You should talk to Come her see about me. that. Yeah, so um, I'll get out of here and let you wrap it up. <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, like Dave said, the last two months have been a whirlwind, but in the absolute best way possible. Um, I have absolutely just been overjoyed getting to come into this building and see all of the amazing things that God has done here um, and also just get to get to know your kids and your families and love on them each week. Um, it has just been such a joy for me. If you would have told me, even four months ago that, hey, you're gonna take the children's director position interim, and then you're gonna take it on completely. I would have been like, no, you're no, not, you're funny. I'm not gonna step back from real estate and do that. But here we are. And I am just so looking forward to the things that God has in store for us coming up. We have a lot of fun events coming up. Um, and it's gonna be a lot of fun and exciting thing. So like Dave said, if you are not volunteering and you are interested in volunteering, please come see me. We also have one of our big three is gonna be Vacation Bible School coming up. Um, if you are interested in helping with that for the week, please come see me. We're gonna have registration for that coming up as well. Um, but yeah, like Dave said, I am just so looking forward to all of the things and it has just been really cool to see what God has done these last two months. So I'm gonna close us out today with the big three. Our first one is VBS, it is June 3rd through the 6th from 9 a.m. to 12. So we will have, if your kids are in preschool right now, so they'll have completed preschool through completed fifth grade. Those are the age ranges that we will have. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna need a lot of volunteers. So if you are available, please sign up to come and also bring your kids and have them invite their friends. Number two, is the Reading It Right men's event. Come learn how to better study your Bible. That is April 20th, is that right, Gail? Okay, April 20th from at 8.30 a.m. Okay, so come April 20th at 8.30 a.m. Um, that is for men and Kay will be speaking. That's gonna be really good. I'm excited to hear about it. And our last one <laughs> is the new attender event is next Sunday right after service. Um, if you have not registered for that, please register online. If you are new and you have not gotten to meet the staff, please come uh, bring your family. We would love to meet you. We would love to answer questions with you. And we serve really good food at that. So um, with that, I hope you all have a wonderful week and we will see you next week. <laughs>